I realize that some of the people watching these longer episodes may have a bit of anxiety about not the length necessarily, but what's being covered because these are about True Detective, but often in these discussions, Matt and I will stray far afield and, and get very off track. And we let that happen, obviously, because that's what's interesting to us in the conversation, and that's where it naturally goes. So I thought what I would do is, before we jump into it, just give a quick introduction, just explain a few of the things we talk about, and let you know that if you want to jump right to the meat of the True Detective analysis to get to some of those topics, you can go to the 45 minute and 22 second mark. So go there if you want to get right to the true detective stuff. Otherwise, if you just want to meander and explore different topics that are related, then start from start from the beginning right after this after this introduction. Uh, we got into language and also alchemy. There's an interesting discussion about alchemy, the history of alchemy, and also the the link between alchemy and science. And then after jumping into true detective, we start talking about religion, in particular the structure of religion and how religious institutions can calcify and actually hinder the progress of those who are seeking closeness with whatever it is that's divine. And that is tied into the um, uh, episode that we were watching this week, which is episode episode six. Uh, and then we talked about marriage. Obviously, that's a pretty strong theme, the masculine and the feminine marriage dynamics. So we got into that. At the end, we got into more the dynamic between the masculine and the feminine, which is a pretty strong theme in this episode and throughout the show. So that's it. And I hope you enjoy the episode. I think our language is is limited somewhat because just the way that in in English I think we have compared to other languages we have a, a limited vocabulary for what we need to express and so huh. within our within our language structures we have a lot of subjectivity so my language cloud is different than your language cloud and maybe because English is more descriptive as opposed to extremely specific. Mm. Um, uh, there's a lot of room for misunderstanding, but that also makes the language more colorful. Comparing it to Chinese, I mean, if you look at a book, a Chinese book and the translated version of that same book, the Chinese book will be like this, and the English book will be like this. Because oh. English, English, you have to say a whole sentence in order to express what you could use two characters to express in Chinese. Um, more so traditional Chinese characters, some of those characters would contain the information and the subtleness that we would take two or three sentences to um, to to communicate or to express. Is it because you think partially they all agree on the subtlety? So when they hear a word, they automatically know what comes packed in it. But then in English, you have to use a lot of words to sort of explain what you're not trying to say. I think it's a couple of things. So one, I think because our language is such a hodgepodge, of other languages more so than other languages are hodgepodges of other languages. I mean, you can say that you can say that Spanish and Portuguese and Italian are uh, de derived from Latin, but they and they and they borrow from each other. But because they're in the same they're in the same family, it's it's not it's qu not quite the same as what you would have in in English, where where we don't even know where our words come from, and um, we I think. I think because, maybe partly because of that, or partly because of uh, regional differences and the fact that language, English is spoken all over the world, there's a lot more room for variation and subjectivity. I mean, if you go to yeah. Australia, you're not going to understand budgie smuggler, maybe, in, unless you... I know what budgie smuggler means. Most people <laughs> don't know budgie smuggler, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's That's funny. It's like um, it's like a rock being washed down a river. If the rock is washed down the river in a larger river for longer, then the edges get really smoothed down. And because English is spoken worldwide, it has to accommodate that. And so it becomes uh, smoother because of it. Whereas if you go yeah. into, you would think a, a very small local language in New Guinea or something would be very simple 
because it's such a small tribe, those are the most complex languages. Those are the most yeah. subtle, nuanced languages mm -hmm. with the hardest corners because there's no sand <coughs> on the edges. That's not my analogy, yeah. but... Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, thinking about Spanish, it does seem like they get... Yeah, they don't have... To... I, I thought the way I perceived it was, man, it's not very descriptive. There's not a lot of... Uh, they don't maybe and, and granted i'm not a pro in it by any means but just from what i can grasp it's i, I thought man it, it's not very flowery it doesn't have a lot of everything is much more to the point <laughs> and direct and it seems much more efficient that there's not a lot of room for color and but maybe that's has to do with what you said that for it's uh, the english is inefficient but highly I, I that's yeah but that i think that leaves room for that's the reason that our i mean our literature is so you you can't even pin down genres anymore because because it's just the the, the different the variety of writing styles it's yeah. it's immense but if you look at maybe Chinese, for example, you have different different writing styles, but it's much more, and I'm not a pro either in Chinese, but it's much more narrowly confined, and every character you use maybe calls back to some 2,000-year-old reference that you don't yeah. know unless you're, you know, enmeshed in the culture. Yeah, I got I to blow my nose, hang on, but I want to respond to that. You know, we could... Yeah. Please. <laughs> Go ahead. The world is watching. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know if you'd want to edit, like, I'd give Here's you a heads up and you could edit it out. Got an idea. I could. If you give cool. me, like, five seconds like, like this, yeah. then whenever there's a nose blow, <clears throat> it's just, that, that's too possible. That's too, that's too artificial. Give me, like, a, give me, like, a, just a normal, like, a listening face. <laughs> uh-huh. All right, and then I can basically. <laughs> that is your every time you blow your nose, I'll take that. I'll just place it over your nose blow. Yeah. Even if okay. you're. <laughs> Go ahead. Cool. I like to take a look at it and check my progress to see if I'm getting better because you know the less color there is to what you find in your napkin or in your toilet paper. I was going to say, means... doesn't that also, doesn't that also, does that also work for poop? No, the less, well, hopefully. the less color there is, the more you should be worried. Oh Jesus. It's grayish white. I, I, I don't have, long... <laughs> I, really don't I have some have letters to write. <laughs> yeah. Edith, go get the paper. Someone bring me done. my feather pen. <laughs> yeah. I'm drawing a feather pen right now, sort of. Uh, I know you are. What's the th what's the thinking behind <clears> it? <throat> Inception. Um, the thinking behind it is it's just about translation, uh, just to give a very clear reminder, a very clear icon or symbol about. Oh, it's about translation, and uh, I'm looking at it over there. Um, Yeah, I don't know. It's maybe sort of how much. So the idea I was thinking of with this image is that you've got these three different people groups coming together to work together and translate stuff together so that they can understand each other and then put all that stuff out in the world so that a lot of people can understand it. One of the points of the Toledo School of Translators was it was set up by the Alfonso, I forgot the guy's name, but that school existed at a time when they were codifying the Spanish language, Castellano. And one of the points to their method of codifying it was they wanted to make it accessible to as many people as possible and make it understandable by as many people as possible. So if, uh, <clears throat> and it, and they were translating all these different types of texts. I think I sent you a list, but that included 
mathematics, medicine, astronomy, but then also alchemy and astrology. Uh, and a lot of that, I think, uh, it, that came under the scrutiny of the Catholic church because it criticized Aristotelian science. Uh, if you listen to that Terrence McKenna stuff, you can, you can catch it. And he goes to that stuff a lot. And so you've essentially got these sort of people dealing with a lot of mystic ideas and trying to, and if you're trying to trans, if you, if I'm trying to get across to a Spanish speaker, a mystical idea that I understand in English, I mean, I've, I've got to, I don't know how to do that. And so probably it wasn't take, English though, was it? No, 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 it wasn't right, right, right. It wasn't English. Uh, but just as an example of how could we relate to it now? Yeah. So if I, if, or if I went to China today and then tried to get across an idea about the lapis uh, lapis lazuli, lapis lazuli, or the yeah. Philo- yeah, the philosopher's stone to a Chinese person, I don't know any Chinese. I wouldn't know where to begin. And so imagine any of these translators. And sometimes this happened. They would these people would come there and not know the language they're going to translate into, but they would work together and they would have to speak to each other. They would have to spend time with one another. And you've got Christians, Jews, and Muslims all living together and working for these common goals. And, and the, the body of knowledge they're translating is incredibly important. And it then goes out into the world to do all these important things to help people sort of, ideally, I would like to guess, just understand, be conscious and understand consciousness, just further, further that uh, goal. So... It's interesting. Yeah. And, it's interesting. So, so, so the collaboration is what had to did did that actually move anything forward? I mean, what was actually carried forward by that? Was it language usage? Was it was it the the way that we understood the texts? What what actually moved, even if it was incremental? So one of the one of the things that I read, and most of this just comes from the Wikipedia articles I've read, which have been quite a few at this point. But it sounds like uh, the thing that moved forward was, number one, the Spanish language. So Castellano became more, more codified language. What was, it, and, what was it before? It was just a dialect of Latin, kind of a, a, a hillbilly Latin, basically? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, but there, there, are, there are even still there are several languages existing in Spain right now. You've got... Uh, Gallego, which is up in Galicia, you get uh, get Castellano, which is Spanish, and then uh, what can I remember it? It's Barcelona. Um, what's the language here? Oh, crap, I can't remember. It's ah, but it, it's <clears throat> oh, and then you get like Pais Basco. You've got the Basque language, which is up in the north eastern section, and then in, in Barcelona, and that so in Catalonia, Catalan, yeah, Catalan. And so you've got all these languages existing now, today, and then you can find these. I, th- I saw these illustrations at a museum here uh, recently, and it had all of these different figures and different types of dress that were specific to the regions uh, of Spain. And then above each one of them, it had the different languages that they spoke, which are some of them I mentioned. Were they, were they legitimate languages or were they dialects of the same thing? Uh, I mean, I know that I that know. distinction is not often clear, but if there's a shared vocabulary and they can communicate essentially seamlessly, yeah. then then maybe dialects. Well, if you look at Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian, and I've I've my Scandinavian friends say that we're not supposed to say we can understand each other, but we do because they have sort of some sometimes the, the level of pride of, about their language and their ability to you know that they'll say oh, i can't understand them they're swallowing all their vowels or they sound like they got cotton balls in their mouth but it's they could talk with each other then the line um, the line is not clear the definition of dialect as opposed to language distinct languages is, is, is it can be pretty fuzzy probably a spectrum yeah 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 definitely but that's interesting that it had to be what was the purpose of codifying uh, codifying the language then? Was it so that they could 
translate the texts so that they could sort of propagate the um, uh, the teachings of the Catholic Church, or was it was it just a language think... was it just a language project like uh, like Webster? I think it was just a language. From what I read, it sounds like it was just a language project, and that uh, I think it was the it was the king, or it may have been a bishop, but it wasn't to just further the aims of the Catholic Church. That stuff came later. That came the the emphasis on furthering the aims of the Catholic Church came along and brought the heresy uh, condemnations with it. So, and, and that's part of the image too, is that when you get these condemnations handed down, then that's when the school of translators uh, gets cut off, essentially. They all disperse and go to other places. And so before that, it just seemed more like a, a, hu- a humanist goal. It's maybe, uh, it, it had more of a tinge of humanism rather than it did, uh, it, you know, any ecclesiastical goals or just propagating the theology of the Catholic church, because a lot of the stuff they were translating had was antithetical to what the Catholic Church was teaching. That's why it got shut down. So why did they have to so so I mean if you have people in a city from different faiths, uh like maybe you would have in Constantinople, um yeah. you have to also have a shared project. It can't just be a shared space. So what was their drive to actually collaborate? What were they contributing to each other's ends? So one of I can only think of an anecdote. I'd have to. I haven't actually read my notes in a while, but the anecdote I can remember is that one of the the kings uh, liked having. It was a he liked having this Jewish physician around because he was really good. And the reason, and and that physician was there. I, I think the guy was there to help with translating work to begin with. So. Um, uh, I, I don't know, maybe just having that vigorous exchange and research going on was just as as uh, as an effect, just all this sort of beneficial stuff happened. Kind of like with studying alchemy, these guys were basically philosophers, but it happens that they discovered all this hard scientific stuff we still use today. So, I mean, so, it's pretty interesting. yeah, I, again... This is this is stuff that before I do the video portion of the uh, Patreon, I'll go back and be able to. Okay, yeah, these are the points that link together and sort of lay out. To, yeah, hopefully to get other people interested in it because right. it's really cool. No, it is interesting. I'm uh, interesting. I'm very interested in the um, the different eras in which either language ha- was forced to change or. Uh, religious groups had to exist in the same space. In some mm-hmm. cases, they had to collaborate, and others they didn't. Like, and I would, I would even want to look at it in in New York. I think there's some of that uh, going on in New York to an extent, with, because there are community projects, but um, maybe to a lesser extent than than that period of time. I mean, I don't know anything else about it. But so when when Can you the, give more specifics about the projects you're talking about, well, the the projects in New York are more community oriented so there are the sort of community projects that a religious group would undertake in Constantinople and maybe in uh, maybe there um Toledo. Toledo is it pronounced Toledo is it the same as Toledo Ohio Ohio no, same, it, same it, pronunciation like, no no it'd be Toledo oh okay okay it's something like that not Toledo but it's I just don't want to sound pretentious, maybe, but then I don't want to do disservice to how it's actually. It's Toledo. You can say Toledo. It doesn't doesn't bother me. Okay, it's fine. So Toledo, España. When when the uh, when the church actually came in, we were talking a little bit about um, about this just before by text message. Um, when the church actually came in, uh, were they were they persecuting the specifically the Cath uh, the Catholics? who were working on the translations or were they basically just persecuting everybody, including the, the Muslims and the, and the Jews? So what it sounds like is for a while there, you had the presence of the Catholic church 
But one of the bishops was like, no, you guys just keep doing what you're doing. This is fine. And it, some of the translation work actually flourished under that. Yeah. Or he just kept it going. What, what was going on there already, uh, when this guy came in, he just kept it going. And actually, you know, I think funded it, supported it. And it, I don't think he really put any restrictions on what kind of content they could handle. And But then with the, I think it's with specifically the Paris condemnations of... I think the 13th or 14th century, that's when uh, you start getting the, putting a kibosh on, okay, you can't, you can't work with this text anymore because it criticizes Aristotelian views of the solar system, which are what the Catholic church had adopted to maintain their own doctrine. So, um, yeah. So it, it for a while it was it, the presence of the, it sounds like the presence of the church as an authority there as the main authority wasn't a, a big deterrent to the translation work. But then when sort of the, the iron hand, the iron fist of the church came down, that's when it became, uh, you know, a, a negative for the work. <clears throat> Does, um, does Joseph Campbell have a book about the um, the Inquisition? No, I think or it's... something that that covers it somewhat is part of it because I feel like I might have read something by him when I, I was younger, but I remember it only vaguely. I can't really remember it in a lot of those books maybe in occidental mythology he'll get into it and maybe in creative mythology but those are the only of i don't remember any specific books that dealt with the inquisition he deals with alchemy a lot and i think it's uh i don't know it's one of the last two in the masks of god series he deals with it because young dealt with it and yeah it's cool why is it cool it's cool because it's just an elaboration of those ideas uh, geared towards psychology. And then when you understand what those guys were doing in psychological terms, and then you know the overlap that that sort of autocorrective work on your own psychology, what that has to do with Eastern ideas, meditation, Buddhism, yogic practices, the Vedas and all that whole body of work, then you then you see, oh wait a minute, these Western people were dealing with Eastern dealing with Eastern ideas too, and it's just it's just a you know, there there is you know one person is looking at the subject matter from this side of the earth, and the other person is looking at it from this side of the earth, and it just it's it's fun then to, to be able to think about those things using both lenses and then synthesize it maybe into something. Uh, would, that you would, understand. So, you, would you say that alchemy in its day was sort of was proto science, essentially, right? So, in a way, what what? Okay. The closest thing. Keep, keep going. Okay. Okay. So, so if if science and the um, the Enlightenment were sort of alchemy 3.0 in some ways what i'm interested in what was lost in other words in other words the there seems to be a mystical aspect to alchemy that was sort of stripped away by <coughs> the scientific um i can't say scientific the enlightenment let's say um and rationalism okay. so is there yeah. is there a pretty smooth transition between them and what was lost in the transition, if anything, or are they too different to even call proto science or early science and and uh, post enlightenment scientific rationalism, whatever you want to call it? It sounds like any, from what I know, from what I've read, from the, from what I've listened to, it sounds like that any science that came out of alchemy was just by accident. It was just because these people the alchemists were just experimenting 
and but they they weren't maybe the the point of it was not to figure out how to manipulate any manipulation of the physical world was merely symbolic of the manipulation and metamorphosis of the inner world of the psyche of the consciousness of psychology that's kind of what i'm asking though because because yeah. when i think of alchemy i think of sort of early attempts at developing a sort of theory that mm -hmm. may or may not work out and then some uh mystical ideas thrown in and then some experimentation and um and then going back to the drawing board and, and trying again that seems to be early stirrings of the scientific the scientific method so but then but then yeah. layered on top of that heavy mystical ideas and and much heavier emphasis on the inner world right so that's i guess that's what i mean by not necessarily trying to find out what gravity is or anything like that but but just yeah. the the basic sort of preliminary building blocks of what would become what we now call science and then what is missing from what is now science. Yeah. Um, so to give a brief history of alchemy, uh, it seems like from what I read with Eliade and Terence McKinnon that talk I just listened to, he goes into, he mentions Eliade a lot. Uh, and he mentions this book that I just read, The Forge and the Crucible. And it's about the history of alchemy where it got started. And it got started with uh, metalsmiths. And so when, and, it, and so you've got these people that figure out how to manage metals and ore and things like that. And it, and that sounds like, oh, that's fine and good. We know you put this with that, you heat it up to this and that, and this comes out, right? But they had a, the way that they understood it, that process and the manipulation of, metals and ores that came out of the earth is that these metals and ores existed as in an embryonic stage in the earth. And when we pull them out of the womb of the earth, and then we perform these processes to turn something into iron, uh, whatever the, the chemical process, the forging process to take a crude ore and turn it into usable iron is that was a, a mystic process. They, treated it with great reverence even just having a, a so it wasn't just a, was a series of steps to go through there was a s sort of higher level tier of importance to it and and uh, spirituality if you want to call it that some something higher than just doing the uh doing the steps kind of it's kind of like primitive hunting versus commercial agriculture today mm. or commercial uh meat production right. right because it's not you push a button and all this organic material gets slaughtered and processed and blah, 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 it's done. Whereas in the past, as a primitive hunter-gatherer, you had to, I mean, they worshipped, they, they thought of themselves more as uh, co-actors on a stage with the animals. They saw, at one point, animals as brothers and sisters. They would talk to them as though they were other intelligent beings on the same level of intelligence. So, and what I'm trying to get at there is that in the primitive aspect you had this reverence towards something as simple as a food supply right they treated it as holy as sacred as a, a mist and they had a lot of mysticism and mystical appreciations attached to it right wrapped, okay. wrapped in lore yeah right now take that same sort of perspective and put it into alchemy and making metal and ore all of this sort of religious religious all the sacred activities that come along with hunting and and think for example just really quick uh there's there was a tribe that i think franz boaz uh worked with and they were he was with this tribe this is in the early 1900s maybe late 1800s and he 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 had i think they he called them pygmies i don't know if that's a slur now or not but it was um i'll use a hashtag a tribe. to find out <laughs> yeah. Any pygmies out there? So, yeah. So I, I think they still exist. I mean, they're I, you know real people group. So pygmy is uh, also pygmy is also used in other ways though. It's used to reference a yeah. small version of an animal. Right. And in matchstick men, they're dust bunnies. So 
if you have if you've seen that movie i don't know if you have mm, i think i saw it when i was maybe 12 or something i i, I deleted nicholas cage in a good role <laughs> deleted most of those memories yeah so franz boaz uh has this these i think three pygmy uh tribes people with him and he's sort of doing some exploring and he was an eth uh, ethnographer um ah, anthropologist and he's out in the bush with him and he says hey i'm hungry Do, would you guys mind going and hunting for some food and they're like yeah okay but there's a big process that goes along with it they can't they don't just go out and hunt and bring something back there's this whole religious ceremony that goes along with it that involves sympathetic magic so that what they perform before the hunt actually is realized during the hunt and then after they make the kill they come back and they put in some case yeah they come back and they i think they pour blood on the the area where they performed the ritual before the hunt so you've got the ritual before the hunt then you've got the hunt and then you come back to the area where you perform the ritual and you put blood back in the earth so similar religious or sacred ceremonies were performed with the alchemy the the iron forges and, and this is the beginning of alchemy in the sense that what they were thinking was when we take this ore out of the earth we're essentially accelerating a natural process eventually this ore whatever it is is going to reach its fulfillment across time in becoming iron itself or becoming gold right that's a huge it's all going to become gold uh, so when we take it out of the earth and we perform these alchemical processes on it, we are essentially bringing something to its perfection or completion. And that was the sort of philosophical mystical idea that got attached to the hard scientific process of making iron, right? Smelting iron or, uh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sort of where, where the philosophy came in mm -hmm. and then where the hard science came in. Okay. And so... Then well, that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't, I wouldn't call that the hard science. That's, that's the process. The hard, hard science is discovery of the unknown. So, okay. so that's the part that I am particularly curious about. This, the science of the unknown is taking the ritual and then doing a variation on the ritual because there's a hypothesis about, for example, how to get to alchemical, <coughs> alchemical gold, if that's what you're trying to, uh, if that's what you're trying to get, because if that's part of yeah. the, the lore of alchemy and you know that's the end state, then that's where you want to reach. But you can't. But but people weren't nobody was able to reach it. Right. But still, there were a lot of ideas about what might we I mean, we could go with mix in a falcon feather or whatever. I don't know. But whatever yeah. people did to try to reach that end state then seemed to be a kernel that moved forward. And I'm I'm. I don't know, so that's why I'm actually asking you because you, you seem to know more about the subject than me. That sounds right. I mean, what you're thinking sounds right. I would say that the, the hard science was a byproduct, an accident almost of them just experimenting, but they're experimenting. They're, the main thrust of their experiments is not the concern of physical results. It's more of a psychological, spiritual result. And then it happened when they were experimenting with all these different ideas and which included real materials then out of that experimentation came real methods and processes we use today. So, uh, it was as far as what was lost. It's probably just more of the idea of self in, if you're going to look at alchemy as something from which, scientific methods eventually came out of then it doesn't seem like we necessarily have the philosophical uh, or psychological intentions with in in some attempts in science in some yeah but in some no it's, maybe we it's can more... use reverence it seems to me like <clears throat> like the um what, what you're describing is a reverence for the earth Mm -hmm. And uh, an, an appreciation of where everything comes from, and a yeah. connection to the um, a connection to the life giving 
force, whatever that happens to be. I mean, maybe different for alchemy slightly, but it's the same the same general concept. Then we sort of yeah. extract out the filaments of that that's useful to progress in another way, but then have to scrap the 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 lore and scrap the um, the sort of higher level things that were attached to those out of necessity because the world started moving at a faster pace. And if innovation is going to happen, then if you bind all of those, maybe those discoveries, if you bind those together with the, um, maybe the ritualistic side or the, um, the beliefs that people used to connect with those processes, then everything gets slow. So, I mean, maybe, maybe a, a byproduct of getting rid of those was that we are able to move a lot faster, sort of unfettered by, um, by useless stuff or useless ideas. But then maybe because yeah. we do that and we've lost a sense of reverence for where everything comes from and we lost our sort of tether to the, um, the life-giving force or whatever that happens to be, then... Yeah. Uh, we we sort of um, we do it with such reckless abandon that we don't even care about the results of our actions. So we have maybe a two hundred year period in which we're just taking those those fundamentals because they're so useful and engaging in them with reckless abandon, essentially, until the earth starts to starts to retaliate in a way. And I wonder if there has to be a sort of re reconvergence of some of those things to help us, you know, move forward either a little bit more slowly or move forward yeah. quickly with a, an understanding of where it's coming from, because that seems to be the thing that was separated. And maybe we, maybe we, d we st still have a lore maybe, but maybe it's different. Maybe now it's um, a destiny that we, we are destined to, become immortal or or live in in google drive or something like that someday i don't know i don't know yeah i, I think i think you're going to get a lot out of that terence mckenna talk because everything you just said is pretty much exactly what he goes into and sort of the idea of well first off the the reverence for the the materials right the reverence for the ore going back to the alchemy going back to the the smith right so the smith they saw caves and things like that and openings in the earth where they get material out of it they saw it as the mother the the it's womb of the earth so naturally, they, yeah right 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 and so now we do a is that, now we do a cesarean section bitch open up <laughs> <laughs> I, I think eliotti may even go into I can't remember if he uses a C-section illustration or not, but yeah. Um, and then uh, Terrence McKenna was talking about there's sort of a, a re. This is in 1991, but he was talking about the repopularization or the renewed interest in sort of archaic ideas. So, for example, looking at stuff like alchemy and trying to figure out, well, why did, why did it exist? It's so weird. Why do you want to turn lead into gold? That just seems like a, a weird frou frou kind of stupid thing, but yeah. really it's not about turning the material from one state into another. It's about a personal, uh, psychological transformation. And so that's what he says that people are sort of rediscovering those things texts to try to they, they look at okay we've got the science that can accomplish these great things but great things for what what are we we can we can make these discoveries and things but what does it do for us how does it what does it do for us psychologically spiritually mentally and uh, and so he he he's making the one of the cases he's making is that it seems like these alchemists we're doing that. Why do we make these discoveries? Discoveries that tell us what about ourselves, about right. how we think, how we live our lives, how we interact with people. Where does where's our reward? Why do we do this stuff? So, I think so. Yeah. So <clears throat> I I know a little bit about where he was going with that. He had this idea that there was a re a reawakening of the interest in uh, mysticism uh, in, involving hallucinogenics and that sort of thing. 
but mm -hmm. I don't know where that's coming from. So I would agree that we definitely severed the ties to the earth that we had before and the reverence for where our the things that provided us our the ability to live. The we we severed that connection, but but I don't see any signs that that's coming back. And I think maybe because he had that perspective, I think one thing that happens when someone becomes very interested in a thing, in a subject, in a field, is that then when they look around because of the natural human pattern-seeking ability that we have, um, because of that, we, we sort of have a, what's it called? Um, a reinforcement bias? Is that what it's called? Um, selective Confirmation bias? Con yeah, that's, that, that's what I was looking for. Confirmation bias. So I'm interested in this now, and I suddenly see where it exists around me, even though it's no more significant or larger than it was ever, right? Mm -hmm. Because I notice it now. And you wouldn't notice it before because you weren't interested in it before. So I think there is some confirmation yeah. bias going on with him, perhaps, maybe. I'm not sure. Not that, we sounds... don't, not that we don't need to rediscover our, our links to the, to the earth and, and, you know, obviously we have an issue with that, but I don't see that happening. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, if you look at, I, I think he would say, what was it? If you, in that talk he gives, it seems like he mentioned the, uh, was it? Oh, yeah. So a lot of these new discoveries, the hard science, for example, John D, the whole reason that England was able to go to the, the new world and make the nautical progress that they made was because of John D and he was the alchemist to the queen. And a lot of his ideas came out of or stem from alchemical principles and theories. The same thing with, I think uh, McKenna makes the case for Rene Descartes saying using he um, saw an angel. Yeah. Yeah, that thing. He talks about that, yeah. So, just, and then uh, there's that quantum physicist in the 20th century that he was, he was all into alchemical ideas and left might hand been, literature. Might have been Niels Bohr? I don't think so. It was a different guy, but apparently he had, he was in California, I think, and he had orgies at his house and he was just a, uh, he, he went, if you look at stuff like Aleister Crowley, Crowley, or Anton LaVey, and sort of, well, specifically Crowley, and sort of his pansexualism and all that kind of stuff, then you see the role that, you, you see the type of life that somebody that esoteric lives, and you think, oh, that's just this weird thing that's happening over there, but then you see those same principles and same lifestyle lived by somebody who makes a huge contribution to something like physics, and it's like, wait a minute, there might be something useful in those ideas somewhere in there. I mean, John D, John D uh, astrological stuff for Nate Descartes. So. Yeah, but some, some would say that those are um, <coughs> things that almost hinder, well, not hinder, but baggage from the time that you live in. In other words, whatever... Whatever time you live in, you're bound to be tied up in some kind of nonsense, whether it's a superstition or a, a, a belief system. You know, there are the, the person who led the Human Genome Project was a, a pretty devout, devout Christian. So what? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we're, every person who does anything mm -hmm. useful is going to be going to have other attachments and other other beliefs. But the the interesting question is, do those things, those beliefs forward it in any sense or any way do those give birth give rise to those contributions or do they hinder mm. contributions and as someone who's who's less attached to mm, superstition or uh you know archaic traditions someone who's less attached to those things can they make more contributions can they discover things that they they uh they otherwise wouldn't have you know what i mean yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It was, it, I mean, in that 
it was a Christian that discovered did the human genome project. So maybe there was something bound up in the way his brain functioned, which came from his religious background that it, it but I don't, you know, that doesn't speak to the, I mean, imagine what part of, uh, any, any belief system, you know, what is it showing us and what is it not also not allowing us to see what think of the scientific method? What is it showing us? But what is it also not allowing us to see? So it's, there'd be a positive and obscuring and also an, an obscuring and also enlightening aspect to everything. And because, and that goes into the idea of pair of opposites, because if you see one thing, that means you don't see another thing. Right. So, well, I think, I, yeah, yeah. And there, there, there are a lot of examples of that, and it's very difficult to say where the the line is, and whether it was, whether it was a boon or not to the person who had it. So, for example, even Isaac Newton, yeah. who is, you know, regarded as the most rational person, once he reached the limits of his his theory about gravity, once he reached that, what was the thing that actually made gravity? actually go what was the thing that pushed it what was the force behind it he didn't know so he ascribed that to the divine force you know it doesn't matter what it is oh, that makes it movie? happen no he, def he basically he was able to figure out all right the thing that that makes stuff fall down is the same thing that makes the moon go around and if you fire a cannon fast enough without friction air friction it's going to just keep going around and around if it has the right velocity mm -hmm. figured out that gravity is all the same thing but what exactly is gravity and so because he couldn't come up with an idea about what gravity was what gravity is then he just yeah. said well it's a divine force i don't know that's that's god he left a gap for that maybe if he hadn't done that if he had said well hold on a second maybe maybe this is telling me something else and he had moved a little further he might have discovered that space time is warped and he might have he might have uh, made Einstein irrelevant in that sense. He might have realized that gravity is caused by a warping of a four-dimensional space-time, right? That's all. That's what gravity basically mm. is. And, I mean, we don't really know what gravity is at a deeper level, but still, that's a step further. So he might have gone there had he not just said, well, that must be angels, I don't know, because it doesn't matter what it is. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. Season totally. <laughs> season one, episode six of True Detective. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you want to get into True Detective? <laughs> no. No? Yes, let's this, do it. No, so, I, I think there's a parallel here. I think I can segue. <laughs> you ready? It, Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. This, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an attempt at segueing into True Detective. Let me take a You're sip. Turn lead into gold. <laughs> Our leaden, stupid conversation into a golden. Go do it. So we were talking about how the Catholic Church persecuted the translators in Toledo, and how they had reached a point where they were fearful of losing power, essentially, and so they had to go go iron fist and you saying that before because we had talked about that before immediately came to mind when rust and that pastor the revival pastor were having a conversation about why he left the church why he left the revival and and he said he said politics and then he went into more details about what those <clears throat> politics were actually it's because he saw the he saw the pictures of the of the children in that book but it is still it is still politics. So I'm interested in the the dichotomy between the true desire that he had originally to get close to God and the structure that he tried to climb up to get close mm. to God then being so complex and um uh, past its past its time that it's impossible to actually get there because because it's yeah. It now serves its own interest, if that makes sense. The yeah. the religious institutions that we build, no matter which one you're talking about, if they exist long enough, they calcify 
as a way to preserve themselves, but by yeah. virtue of them calcifying and in, if, if need be crushing opposition uprisings or whatever, by, by virtue of their doing that, they then prohibit anyone from attaining what they're trying to attain by sort of pursuing those faiths, which is the reason that they exist in the first place. In other words, it's an institution for people to help people get close to God. It's an institution to connect people with the divine. And now it is yeah. impossible to reach the divine because the institution has essentially hardened itself so that it can survive almost as a business. Yeah. 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 That's my segue. Totally. Campbell talks about, Campbell mentions uh, one philosopher who says you, you have to, you, he, he's, he said sometime in his life, I'm leaving God for God in the sense, sort of like I'm leaving the church so I can actually go find God or I'm leaving this religion, which was supposed to bring me to God so I can actually go find God. You know, this, this religion maybe provided some helpful scaffolding for a while at the beginning, but then it becomes calcified and actually an obstruction to what you're actually seeking. You get tangled up so, in the catacombs of, of the, the structure. Is that what he meant when he yeah. said silence? What, uh, all I got was silence. What was mm. the line that he said? Yeah. All my life I've been trying to get closer to God. Uh, but I don't know then he, yeah, he says something closer, about silence. The closer I get, or when I got the closest, all I got was silence. I wonder if he meant that, you know, he's he's trying to do something good. The further he gets into it, the more he tries to serve, the more he realizes that this is not where God lives. Wasn't he asking something like, why me? Uh, because he, fa he found the pictures in the book, mm. and then uh, he got... I can't, something happened, yeah, and then he says, yeah, why me, or hey, he didn't, I can't remember, but, yeah. Uh, so in other words, do, do religions need, need to exist, uh, and will, do they have to necessarily become those sort of calcified structures, or, um, or do we have to... I mean, I mean, do we move toward a place where uh, we use we, we use religion to carry culture forward and as a sort of springboard toward our own spiritual adventures, or do we do we let them fade away and come up with new religions uh, that are better 2.0 versions of of the old ones, or do we do we try to completely eject ourselves from the 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 idea of institutionalizing something that is inherently non-institutionalizable which is yeah. the the closeness with god and i mean it, essentially it is yeah. uninstitutionalizable and even if even if it becomes that way you can see plenty of examples of uh of when things need to be revived in order to keep a religion able to 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 perpetuate its dna like the Catholic Church, if the Protestant Reformation hadn't happened, then who knows what, what would have happened to the Catholic Church. I don't think it would still be around. I think the Protestant Reformation acted as a sort of release valve that then allowed people to sort of, in the back of their minds, be able to say, well, there is another thing there, so I'm going to stay with the Catholic Church, and and at least there's at least there's an option for me you know it allowed it allowed so for the the survival of the core tenets of christianity to move forward right and now because churches can spring off there's a a really nice structure for constant upgrades because you can just spin a protestant church off at any point and there are what hundreds of them right so it's a pretty good system yeah. i think i think that's something that the Catholic Church isn't really able to do, at least not to that extent. I know they have Orthodox, uh, Latvian Orthodox <coughs> churches that are different and they're sort of related. But, but um, it seems like it seems like religions and institutions have an evolutionary timeline as well. In uh, the book, 
ah, man, what was it? It was uh, Thou Art That, Campbell talks about that process. And he mentions Oswald Spangler is the guy I was trying to think of last time. Uh, the I Vico, 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 he's a, a philosopher or a writer that talks about this. You've got these four great ages or four great cycles um, that everything goes through. Uh, Oswald Spengler talked about the rise and fall of civilization. And there are these repeating patterns, and part of that is that calcification, that hardening, which make, makes things brittle. And essentially that institution is only self-interested to maintain its own identity, uh, its own process, and it keeps everything that could be a threat out. But the threats are actually the things that lead to rejuvenation and renewal. They do threaten the old structure, but that's fine. It's like a human body. The human body is going to die. That's why you have kids. So you can have the regeneration of that uh, human body to carry on consciousness or, or whatever. And so... Yeah, it's it seems more like the idea of the idea of anything outside that cycle of life and death and rebirth uh, is the the weird thing, the thing that yeah, and and but and because you were talking about the the ineffable, the immutable essentially as something that can't be spoken. It's that quote that we had in the one talk that um, it was <clears throat> not Hans Zimmer, Heinrich Zimmer, uh, Campbell's friend that said the, the best things are unspeakable. The second best are an attempts to talk about it. And the third are, I, I can't remember, but it's, don't, yeah, you can't don't not remember again. <laughs> yeah. That's an important one. We've already, uh, we've already been through this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, trying to, trying to, with, it, McKenna mentioned this too, that anytime you, anytime you speak something, you're speaking something, but you're also not allowing other things to exist, right? You're, you're speaking this, but you're not speaking that. Mm -hmm. And in some instances you're speaking against this, but guess what? All of it is true. And so any attempt at speech is an incomplete attempt. And, but we're, but we aren't given the faculties to apprehend anything completely. So we're all the time dealing with an incomplete apprehension of our surroundings. And then, you know, our consciousness moves up to this point and it's maybe a little bit more complete. Maybe it's just skewed down this direction rather than that direction. And so what we need is for the our, consciousness moves into this direction and then we have to drop off those old ways of trying to apprehend things and take in, learn new things, right? New tools, which means dropping off the, some parts of the old religion uh, or old institutions, but then building a new institution that is that institution 2.0, which helps us then understand at our new level of consciousness, but then consciousness is going to change again. So then we have to keep letting the old stuff that helped us get to where we are, die away and so that we can bring on new stuff which helps us keep going so and it's interesting that there are examples of both that not institutions necessarily but belief systems or institutions that incorporate them as a whole and others that mm. try to fight off the new and then are replaced by something else or at mm. least are sort of superseded by something so i would argue that the um The Bible is a pretty brilliant way to integrate the old and the new. Rather than scrapping the Old Testament, it's there as sort of a backdrop for the teachings of Christ. And by putting them in the same text, <coughs> they validate each other. But you have, a, you have a sort of way of moving from one to the other, Without saying you must follow the old laws, you have to do everything that's in in the Old Testament. But at the same yeah. time, it the things that I'm talking about, if I'm Christ, come from those old teachings, and I'm from Abraham, and this is my tradition. So it's a way to sort of 
this is a way to sort of bring everything into one sort of sphere of acknowledging culture, but also transcending it and allowing it to be refreshed so that it can survive. Sure. But the, the Catholic Church, if that's a tradition by itself, wasn't really able to do that, and it's still going through the pains of its calcification and its inability to adapt. If the Catholic Church... Yeah. If the Catholic <clears throat> Church... <clears throat> you know, fades out in the next 100 or 200 years, it wouldn't, I don't think it would be a surprise to anybody. They're still dealing yeah. with the, the uh, byproducts of their um, inflexibility, the, yeah. their policies on things like contraception and the issues that they have with uh, child molestation, right? And that's dealt with in, in the, maybe the religions that you and I grew up in. We both grew up, I think, in uh, Protestant, Protestant faiths, right? And that just, that sort of thing seems very archaic that that even exists, but it still exists because it's so huge because it's this giant yeah. calcified structure and the churches are still there and people go because, eh, just go, I guess, because I, I sort of, I have an obligation. But I, I have a sense that those, also those older traditions have less enthusiastic followers. So people who grow up in the, the Church of England, for example, and I think definitely a lot of Catholics, not all Catholics, obviously, but a lot of Catholics, um, they go almost as a sort of uh, cultural, they're part of it as sort of a cultural ritual, but yeah. I don't think they have a deep, a lot of people, I don't want to say everybody, but a lot of people don't have, I think, a deep spiritual connection compared to, say, a hardcore Baptist, you know, who yeah. runs around in the church and screams about their love of Jesus. You don't see someone who goes to a uh, a school that's a religious school in England behave anything like that. And yeah. I think religion is the, is uh, is a boring thing that's just sort of part of it all. Part of it's similar to to, to tea and scones, I think, you know, in England. Fish and chips. Fish and chips. Church of England. So you, you, we repeat the things that reinf that are real to us. So I do. I like. I, yeah. I just. I don't know why I go to church, but I go because uh, I don't know. It's just what I've always done. And if I didn't do that, things would be out of whack. I would. My my repetition and my routine would be off, and I would have to rearrange my life routine in my brain. Yeah. To, if I just totally disregarded this thing I've done that my parents have done and my grandparents have done forever, so. So then, where does the that would be, where does that the would divine be, lie? Where does the the genuinely spiritual lie? Then is it at the fringe, the shifting edge? Is it is it somewhere else? Can you mean it, people that are actually pursuing that sort of connection with God? Hmm. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, if there if there is an entity that is that is uh, the divine, if we can call it that, where does it, where does it exist? Yeah, yeah. Where do, where do you go to find it? Right. Where do you go to um, find it? Yeah, yeah. Where does it exist in? Where does it exist now? Today. It seems like the, the it's it seems like it's always been on. It's always it's always beyond, right on and a step away from the fringe because it's always moving further out because it's consciousness. I mean, it's, it's essentially right. consciousness and trying to, it's always expanding. It's always having a new, it's always got a new context because once you, what is it, the Chinese puzzle box? Once you get one layer in, it's just another puzzle and then you get another layer in, but it never ends, right? Right. It's yeah. like a never ending babushka doll or something. Imagine, imagine a, a cicada that's constantly, shedding its skin right and it's it's sort yeah. of crawling constantly crawling forward and we never see it but we see its shells and most of us aren't intellectually or spiritually sensitive enough to know to look for the cicada we just jump on the shells and go see here it is yeah. and and yeah, some yeah, of the yeah. shells are bigger than others maybe it's kind of like that this makes sense i mean we're dumb we're idiots we're just monkeys so it makes sense yeah, and maybe the the more that we can be conscious of that, maybe the better the better time of it we'll have while we're here. So, 
I don't know. I don't know. That's so. Do, do, are you seeking? Do you seek the the spiritual in your uh, in your everyday life? I mean, you're a you're someone who doesn't believe in anything. Do you have a, a sense of maybe we shouldn't even use the divine, but there's something beyond beyond uh, the the mundane we could say, right? The uh, lu- yeah. the luminous, whatever that is. So do you do you do, seek luminous? The, luminous the luminous okay okay <laughs> do you seek that uh, it seems like the thing compelling <clears throat> just waking up the next day is sort of just the chance of exploration maybe and just oh here's a new thing here's a new thing here's a new thing or just uh, maybe new ways to enjoy reality and not freak out maybe just to exist. But as far as define, I don't know. What do you, I mean, that's a weird question. I don't know. I haven't been asked anything like that in a long time. Well, it's weird to me because I haven't been asked in a long time. Well, I mean, this is coming from uh, the hardest of core atheists. I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, but I also recognize that, not that there is actually some – I would distinguish between – when I say spiritual or luminous, distinguish, be, blah, 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 dis, distinguish between something that actually exists as a sort of transcendent power outside of whatever it is to be human and something that feels – beyond the mundane experience of just living and working and and having conversations i think there is a there's a natural there's a hole that we have to to find meaning in life even if that doesn't mean anything on some sort of grand ontological scale it's still this sort of need to feel that Either my life is meaningful or I need to find something that gives me a sense of purpose. And I think that could be it, even if it's work, even if it's even if it's discovering a form of creation, even if it's even if it's you know, reading, whatever it may be, I think that I think that for me, the reason I like to the reason I think maybe we both like to talk about religion is to explore the spaces of, I can't speak for you, but explore the spaces of where, you know, the cicada shells and just look at them and study them as a way to understand how other people have navigated the world throughout history and continue to try to navigate the world. And that exercise in itself is a way to kind of live in the live in the uh not the profane the what is it the um sacred the sacred yeah whatever that is yeah and i wouldn't even try to say anything outside of anything magical or mysterious about it i just think it's um it's part of human experience just like just like uh, the need to the need to procreate and the need to eat i think it's one of the one of the things that makes us what we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For myself, so for myself, it would be one of the things would be having conversations like this, and the other would be finding way new ways of expressing uh, ideas. And that by itself is enough. Yeah, uh, it's yeah because it's fun. It, it compels you to do it again and again and again because there's some reward in it, even if you fail in it. If you you know if you if you have a theory and it turns out to be wrong, but at least you discovered that it was wrong, and now you, in, in, in discovering that you were wrong, you also discovered something new to to experience some yeah, some some new bread for the consciousness's tooth to bite into to you know try to digest. So yeah, I mean maybe that's just being, and it, that's when all these authors and esoteric writers talk about being and well, it's being and being and being is maybe that's what they mean is it's just uh sort of relaxing into being a, an algorithm essentially an input and output uh, well, okay well, <laughs> put yourself in the shoes of of an an ancient 
some some ancient uh whether it's whether it's greece or or whatever um yeah maybe even a an, an ancient sumerian you know there's something that's something that's part of your mental space that is outside of your everyday routine right and for you that is maybe your belief in the ancestors or your um sacrifices that you make whatever it is mm -hmm. right to us now looking back that's just a ridiculous thing that simple people did but that is a real mental space for them at that time they lived in that space they had that yeah. belief and it's nonsense right it's it's a nonsense belief it's not it's not true there was no god in need of propitiation, right? At that time, whatever that was, or ancestors or whatever. But for the people doing the sacrifice, for the people killing the goat, it was an intensely moving experience. People yeah. who walked into early churches, churches seeing, you know, the, the windows would have been an intensely moving experience, a very spiritual thing. So regardless of what's actually there, it's a mental experience that if you don't, seek out and you don't have yeah you could say you're missing out on something so you could say well nothing exists there is no god but i i want to see if i can find that some kind of mental space like that because that's part of my yeah. capacity to feel and experience yeah and if you don't have that drive well then you just sit down and perish i mean that's it you kill yeah. yourself or you just waste away and but then uh, or, or somehow you find a way to uh, compulsively make yourself stop breathing, like just turn off your respiratory function, that involuntary action, right, in your brain. Uh, if if you were really just done, but, you know, if you're not done and there's something compelling you, well, then you're going to breathe. Well, then you're going to get hungry. Then you're going to eat. Then you're going to have to learn how to grow food. And all this other stuff is going to spring from that fire or that hunger to just even if it's just curiosity, what happens next? What happens if I, if I go hunt again? What happens next year? What happens as these kids grow up? What happens as my parents age and I take care of them? So, I think it's like we were, we were talking about before. We have this sort of deep underlying um, mental structure that compels us yeah. to behave <clears throat> in certain ways, desire certain things, and experience certain mental whatever landscapes or whatever you want yeah. to say um put whatever you like in there put a goat yeah. sacrifice in there or maybe the sun god Ra, or maybe uh uh christina applegate whatever you want to put in there just put put it in there and worship whatever you like yeah but it's going to be it's going to occupy that same sort of niche in your mm. in your capacity to experience and i think yeah. That's what that's what people who are very against religion maybe sometimes dismiss a little too quickly is that if yeah. if there's not something and maybe it's your your passionate need to fight against religion and and call out all the hypocrisy maybe that's it but you should maybe recognize that that's what that is your the spark that that is, fills is, that space. isn't it then can you then make the case that all the one person's passionate drive to stamp out our religion is the same it's the same it, it stems from the same source as somebody who wants to tell everybody about their religion i think it's almost this yeah i would say it's it's a, a different socket plugging into the same the same holes base or a different plug yeah. going into the same socket the socket hasn't hasn't changed in the last two hundred thousand years two different colored light bulbs <laughs> Yeah, okay, sure. Whatever. <laughs> Pick your analogy. Yeah. yeah. But I think yeah. Um so I think maybe recognizing that if that is the case is is liberating, a little bit liberating because then you can sort of swim through it all and enjoy a yeah. little bit of all of it. And I I would suspect that that's one reason why you are fascinated by religion when you don't believe any of it. And I I can definitely admit that of myself yeah 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 it's uh 
I think Rust has sort of achieved that spot in his life. Uh, but I was also going to, I wanted to ask you. Are we going to segue but, back? Are we going to segue into <laughs> episode six? <laughs> yeah, well, one thing I wanted to mention, or I wanted to ask is that, so think of how vehemently people believed all those silly things that you mentioned a little bit ago. They vehemently believed that that was the truth and that was real. Okay, and then times changed and then their perception of the world changed. Uh, what do we believe now? That we think this is how things work. This is how this is why things happen the way that they do. This is all of it. This is truth. This is real. Uh, Two hundred years from now, four hundred, ten thousand years from now, it's going to change. So, and how you know, just putting all of these ideas and drives, and how how strongly we'll defend them, uh, how silly they could look. 100 years from now, 50 years from now, if, you know, with just accelerating do you expansion know what, of, go ahead. Do you know what becomes, though, much, when why it becomes so difficult to, I think, talk about that at this point in time is because any discussion of this kind of thing has to incorporate technology, which is shifting faster than we can even process. So okay. whatever we think is vehemently whatever we think is right and moral now, maybe that's the privacy issue, the fact that we believe we're individuals rather than existing in some sort of conscious internet space. Uh, Whatever that is, is going to be tied into whatever technology carries us into the future. Because even, even in the present, even... Even as we communicate on social media and even as we, you know, read each other's comments on YouTube, we're becoming something different than what we were 20 years ago without question. But we don't know exactly what that is. And I think, you know, a lot of the ideas that we think, a lot of the things that we hold to that we view as important, and maybe that's being an individual, maybe that's earning money, working to earn money. Maybe that's the value of hard work. Maybe it's um, because we, we see virtue in hard work. Maybe that doesn't exist in the future. Maybe that's a ridiculous thing. Maybe it's unethical. You know, in ancient Greece, yeah, think, about ancient, think about ancient Greece. Like if you worked in ancient Greece, it was a shameful thing. It was good mm. to own property, but the day, the average day of a, a middle class person in ancient Greece, let's say, okay, let's just say, um, let's let's just say someone, someone in the, in their, in their, in the heyday of ancient Greece, going to the, the agora and, uh, you know, maybe buying some things from the, from the shops, going home, having a nap, and then in the evening having a, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but like, you know, a party. Um, basically, and there's oration going on. That sort of life was the the average day. And if you worked, then you were regarded as a sort of a, a, a poor person. You were regarded as a an outcast. Owning mm. property obviously had something to do with your your value in society, but most of your wealth so, would come from pl- from plunder. Most of your wealth would come from mm. outside, like taxes coming into Greece, basically, right? And mm. so so we see that now as bizarre, but in the future, mm. we may see now this sort of hard work and I've earned a good living <clears> and I make, you know, $120,000 a year as this great virtuous thing. Um, maybe in 100 years, that seems as archaic and and sort yeah. of low to us as it did to to someone who s- spent all day in the acropolis you know yeah it just seems like whatever it seems like whatever we have as our reality now is just an iteration it'll change it'll it, it is kind of like what you just mentioned that their reality and what they held as positive and negative was true for them and then for us now it's it's it seems true and real to us but it's just an iteration and then uh but when if we can some some people some of us sometimes we don't realize that that it's just an iteration it's just a game 
but uh, but w- and when you do, then it seems like you're given a little a, le- a level of autonomy, uh, a level of separation from the compulsion to be a fearful or desirous samsara. You know, get in that whole loop. It's there. It's always going to be there, but at least you know it's there, and you can bob and weave more according to your expanded consciousness and the desires of that sort rather than crowd surf it. brainstem. Yeah. Say what? Crowd surf it. Crowd surf it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh man, this is great being at the front of the stage, but I really could use a beer. What's the quickest way to get through this yeah. crowd? Oh, I'm just going to crowd surf. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I think, I think, um, I don't know. I was reading, I was reading, uh, a book recently called uh, I Claudius. It's an it's a novel, but it's written as a an autobiography by Tiberius Claudius, who was an emperor for a little while, and just the the norms in Rome during the at the beginning of the fall of Rome, you could see it beginning to go down, decadence at a ridiculous level. Um, marriage kind of falling apart which is something that i wanted to mention marriage being this sort of true detective <laughs> stru- structural structural thing that's that's really loosely stuck to i mean divorce was just like a a, a convenience a matter of convenience mm. and there was no there was no morality attached to it there was no mm. immoral sort of uh, stigma connected to being divorced that that sort of makes me it made me think about this this sort of thing that that you know maybe it's our norms about marriage maybe it's uh, maybe it's our our norms about and i think i think privacy is going to be a big one for us and i think yeah. it's our norms about using using our phones a lot and how that's mm-hmm. viewed as sort of a, a negative thing that we people are attached to their phones what if that is what if that is normal what if that is it's more of that rather than less in the future. Um, you know that guy who's really he's really well known online now for giving inspirational talks. His name is Simon Sinek, and he has some good talks. He has a good TED talk about um, what versus why and how companies convey their their philosophy. But he's very against people using cell phones. He's very against um, kids on phones all the time. And he gives a lot of anecdotes to support why it's so bad to have your phone out while you're talking to another person face to face and how that's rude yeah. if you do that and you're showing them that they're not as important as your phone. But I'm I'm yeah. I'm really hesitant to embrace that that worldview because I think sometimes yeah. thing, things seem immoral and it seems like that. But if you think about it for a second, actually what's going on on my phone is often far more important than the person I'm talking with face to face and the fact that i'm face to face with them shouldn't make that shouldn't make that flip you know what i mean yeah I, this is actually yeah. much more important than me talking with you we're actually just talking about what we're going to eat for dinner i'm trying to deal with something really important here you know yeah. i need to look at my phone and i wonder Maybe. if hey, pe- people think oh yeah well phones will go away and we'll have the internet in our brains and projected in front of us but it's going to be more of that rather than less and that's going to shift, I think, and we will we will yeah. see that sort of message as very, I think, archaic in the future. Yeah, and maybe uh, because of the advent of the phone, that things really are important are now available to us, rather than only mundane things being available to us. And you can view ah, that's, that's Ex- another valuable thing to think. <laughs> exactly. But that's but is it okay? But let's let's just like accept that as true for just a second. If we accept that as true for a second, and let's say we're already on board and we're the only two people on board with it, hypothetically, how long is it going to take for everyone else to accept it? Like we have to probably be thirty years dead by the time that that is a fully accepted norm, or something like it is a fully accepted norm. The, the the front of the wave looks ridiculous. It looks ridiculous to, to say that now, now you have access to the things that are important and you can select what's important uh, no matter, regardless of who is physically around you. Yeah. Is, 
an insane thing to say to someone over the age of 40. It's very rude. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also, how do we know that our capacity to discern what is and isn't important has caught up to our ability to demand what is and isn't important, right? Can you, so, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Can you explain that? Well, so if you, so we have the ability, we have the capacity to select on a phone what we want to look at, what we want to dump our time and our brain capacity into. Yeah. What we think is, this is the most important thing I could do right now. That's what <clears throat> sort of we're postulating that is essentially what we're saying when we have, when we're, you know, on our, <laughs> when we're on our phone with the buttons on the side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can, I, um, can you show me your phone real quick? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, so we, we have the, the option, it kind of like with, uh, with sugar, right? Because we have this, uh, this amazing availability and abundance of sugar. But if we, but maybe we don't have the discernment to say, oh, I can have all the sugar I want. And, but we don't have the discernment to say, wait, but I know I shouldn't have, if I want to live and not have diabetes and I shouldn't have as much sugar as my brainstem would compel me to consume. So at least, I mean, there's so many things that come along with it. And so maybe, so even, even now with, so, so using the sugar example, again, now, at least in developed countries and cities, especially, especially affluent cities, we're more able to say, ah, I could have all this ice cream and all this stuff. I could have the Doritos and all that. But if I want these other things 10 years from now, then I shouldn't have those Doritos and buckets of ice cream now. So what if there's the same parallel mechanic that could go on with the phone? That Yeah, there is a lot of abundance and options and a lot of things that we would think are important, but we don't yet have the developed discernment to right now and say, oh, phone gives me exactly what I want right now. But what about 10 years from now? What's it going to, what about 20 years from now? Then we may not treat our phone or any technology the same way that we treat it now. But right now it's, it's affording so many experiences that we haven't had before. That's a really interesting, interesting point. You're sort of making an analogy between 80s 90s McDonald's era before be, before the you know the creation of the organic movement or whatever you yeah. want to call it and and being more health conscious which is if you live in a city kind of a given nobody just eats at McDonald's anymore because we have yeah. sweet green and things like that choices that are much more healthy that can help us reach our for example fitness goals and we have a landscape that we navigate through toward a single point maybe, which is optimal health, optimal pleasure, optimal body shape, something like that maybe. Um, yeah. But I don't know if the phone is analogous to sugar. I don't know that, I don't know that, it's a, it's a very interesting analogy, but I just don't know if it can be an analogy because there isn't enough I think information available to know whether it is, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, yeah. I'd like to see if that's an analogy in five years. Yeah, because, for sure. Because, I, 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 cause, cause you could make the case that it's not that the phone is candy and I love it. You could make the case if someone is playing games or something only that's for entertainment. But if you say somebody needs to communicate with you and you're able to communicate with them instantly. And because of that communication, that's instant then something happens somewhere else in the world that then brings another thing in your life forward. You could say that that is in no way unhealthy, like sugar is unhealthy, apart from maybe having some damage to your relationships and the people around you. And I say this as a person who basically lives on my phone in order to work. Basically, the company yeah. that I, I operate is in China. So everybody I need to deal with is in China. So I have to do everything over my phone. And so my... My mental space is almost divided partially to prioritize that space, which is in another location, <clears throat> and the portal to that location is through my phone, if that makes sure. sense. And all of those things are yeah, very yeah. important. If I, and I, if I'm not there, then my life gets hurt. I am damaged by that. 
And to, to expand upon that analogy, I mean, sugar is neither good nor bad. Sugar is just a collection of particles, as far as we can tell, arranged in a specific connection. If you have too much sugar over the course of so many years, you're probably going to get diabetes or something like that. If you have too little sugar, then your body isn't going to function because you need glucose. It's the bill. So anyway, sugar in – sugar in – that consumed in this amount can lead you to a healthy, well, to to living with all your physical capa- and mental capacities functioning at a hundred percent for sixty years. Sugar consumed in this proportion will shorten that to ten years, and you're going to lose your legs in the meantime. So it's kind of like the phone; just replace sugar with the with the phone. So the the phone consumed this way in this amount could lead to these ama- this I you know what we would call an amazing existence but then also consumed in this amount I, I use I mean maybe it's opposite um, it's but I, I, and what I'm it seems valuable to think that maybe we don't know that yet maybe right. we haven't because it's so new we haven't really, we're not able to discern yet what is what we desire because we don't know the long-term concept of sort of the brave new world we're in <laughs> i think yeah i think the dialogues are still too new and and i think the the health food revolution for lack of a better term at the moment is pretty analogous because i'm sure there were early stirrings and maybe conversations like this one happening in the in the late 60s but they didn't sort of come into the popular um, the popular zeitgeist until, until the, I don't know, mid mid nineties, late nineties, I guess. I'm not sure. (laughs) I don't know the timeline, honestly, but whenever that started to happen, I'm sure that there were rustlings of it much earlier on. Right. Um, so I think it's, it's really hard to say. It's almost like, uh, you're ahead of your time. You're ahead. Who knows? Yeah. There's, there's, and there's, there's been a, a hell of a lot more people that have been ahead of their times before this, any of this. So it's kind of, it's, it's just kind of, yeah, okay, interesting. It's, the, it's, it's, it's fun stuff to think about. But it is the status quo, and I think it's become, it's going to become more the status quo to conduct work and conduct social, social time online. And I am very hesitant to condemn it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I mean, it, same thing. In, in what proportion? It, 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 any activity to a certain level would become undesirable. Right. It would have. So it's everything in moderation. But what is moderation? You know, we haven't really defined moderation as for a lot of things. So. Well, well, I think it has to be similar to the goals for someone who's trying to reach us. Uh, a specific endpoint. I want to move into the future with a good-looking body, with uh, no health concerns, and at the same time, I don't want to suffer every day because I'm just eating broccoli, right? So I want to have all of those things together. So if you yeah. and and maybe I mean I'm sure we've all noticed it. If we spend more than uh, a f- twenty minutes on uh, Instagram or something, we realize there is nothing happening here that is bringing me forward in any meaningful way. If I were to post something that would then maybe allow me to interact with people that I know, that's valuable. But if I spend too much time, then it's now preventing me from writing this or editing that or talking with this person I should be talking with. So it's the optimal, it's, it's sort of like when you're plowing the field, you don't look down at the furrow. You have to look up at the post at the end of the field in order to get the straight line. You have to be gazing into the distance in order to get there, <coughs> whatever that, that is. yeah. So you mentioned marriage, and episode six was yeah. pretty— I keep trying to get back to it, yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, it, it seems like a, an interesting—we hit on something interesting yeah. that we would talk about apart from uh true detective but yet here well, it is touching it on is. And, yeah cool true detective stuff so you mentioned rome and then 
marriage and then looking at uh, uh, looking at sort of the marriage situation, the dynamic between men and women in episode six. What did what did did that register when you watched it at all? Or yes, what? maybe I could just mention that really quickly, <laughs> <laughs> and then you can say a thing, and then I'll after I say yeah, that, was, that was great. Uh, yeah, I've got an idea. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, I think that uh, True Detective is a commentary on on uh, sorry. the decay of American civilization, right? Yeah. And I think sure. that sort of like if you were going to make an analogy between something – between let's say the relationship between two countries and you were to use two brothers as an analogy for those two countries to sort of simplify them and and help people understand right the relationship between the two countries is very complex so you use two brothers you help people understand that the two brothers represent the two countries it's a useful analogy so i think that in this show maybe the dynamics between marty and what's his wife's name What's his wife's oh, name? Maggie. Russ is not his wife. Maggie. Maggie. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, not legal sense. Yeah. Marty and Maggie's marriage stands for more than just the marriage itself. I think it's a commentary on marriage and the, the dynamics between men and women in America and the state of marriage in America. But also, it's a barometer for... America as a whole, that there's something wrong with what we create as our model, as our mold, and what we have as our highest standard, that if we, if we make this our mold and say this is the best possible person, that this will lead to, uh, this will lead to a, a person who can't grow up as a mature adult and who doesn't realize that until maybe the age of 50 as Marty, mm-hmm. as, as Marty, Marty finally starts to figure it out after his marriage has already fallen apart. So it's sort of like his marriage is the vehicle through which we see that this way of being, uh, you know, jock in high school, that just the things that we view as that we put badges on throughout the, 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 the male life, Right, the things that we reward create a person that is unable to cope with reality at a deeper level. In other words, which ends up being a bad situation, which ends <clears throat> up, which ends up basically wrecking that person's life. And those—that's if all of the norms are followed. And so yeah. then, when I was listen, when I was when I was listening to this book, I Claudius, it sort of seemed like that was. The same thing was going on there. Rome is falling. It's not falling in the sense of it. people actually seeing it fall. Everyone has a happy life, and people in the provinces don't know what's going on. But in the sort of core of the apple, you have backstabbing, and you have, uh, you have uh, uh, marriages just disintegrating overnight, and then new marriages happening, and it's causing chaos, but it's it's viewed as completely normal it is the norm like of course mm-hmm. of course you have there are several people you're having an affair with of course why would you get married there's actually a conversation between two women in which they talk about all of the downsides of marriage why would you why would you get married if you have to um, deal with the dowry and and all of that that nonsense why not just yeah, maybe maybe get one for a few years and then play around and then get another one and that's absolutely the norm and it sort of sh- sh- betrays, as a sort of barometer for where Rome is going, it sort of betrays the state of the society in a way. It's sort of like two things <clears throat> happening in parallel, and you can look at this one to figure out what's happening with this one. I think it's the same thing is happening in the show, maybe. It's kind of a mm-hmm. long way to say it, but I don't know. What do you think? Uh, that's interesting. That, yeah, that, well... Yeah, no, I, I've, I, man, I feel like I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions on this one because it's, it, you are married, I'm not, and I'm just curious then, because I could maybe you're married to your be work. easy to, yeah, I got a wife, <laughs> here she is, <laughs> so, yeah, um, 
yeah. It's, you know, it, it seems like it, it can be hip to call marriage a conservative, old-fashioned endeavor. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a, an old-fashioned religious endeavor. Like, it's all about religion or this kind of thing. But then there's also the economic aspect of it. But then, so how, did, how then... Yeah, how did, I guess, what value do you put upon marriage? Do you think, as some people say, oh, that it is I, sorry, the fact... Sorry, someone's knocking at my door. Give me a second. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so if you're interested in a an amazing introduction into Young's work, I recommend this book. It is the Viking Portable library's edition of uh, the portable young as you can see it's pretty thick edited by joseph campbell so he pulls out a lot of the major works from young's oeuvre that were influential to him so uh highly Who recommended the hell are you talking to? i'm gonna cut this part out i'm not gonna use it <laughs> you can How? watch it <laughs> I'll save it in my personal library yeah. of videos, Matt videos. <laughs> so got a little library. Yeah. I've got a little a little folder on my phone that says Matt videos, and I watch them late at night. <laughs> and you minimize them on the screen to as small as you can. As small as I can. I watch it with a little jeweler's <laughs> microscope. Yeah. yeah. For some reason, uh, I don't know why I do that. I don't have to do it, but I want to. Under the covers with a flashlight and a mushroom. Even though I don't need a flashlight because it's on my phone. <laughs> Full of mushroom says, "What are you doing under there? Go to bed. Turn the lights off. I don't want to come in here and find you awake reading again." <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm busy doing my own thing. Get out of here. God can't see me under the sin blanket. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, I guess it'd be interesting to get a young married person's perspective on marriage as couched or put up against what you read in I Claudius, what you're seeing in True Detective, and then what you see around you in the United States. Man, that's a that's a pretty tall order. I, if you feel comfortable asking, no, Eric I think it's Anson. just a, it's a tall order to try to to try to triangulate a, a single point of view on them. But I think um, there's something about there's something about being married that allows you to create a sort of continuous thread with another person who then shares that thread with you that somehow gives another dimension to moving through time. In other words, if you were to move through time by yourself, all you would have was the conversations you have with friends, the thoughts that you have by yourself that I guess carry you through time. But there's something there's something about having another person there moving in parallel with you through time, especially if it's a good trusting relationship that that adds not a layer of, not a layer of um, anything emotional, but just a layer of. Could I? Could to, I go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to think of the right word. Go ahead. Let's let's hear. Is it, it. is it is it something like a bit of, of a ground, in as as other things are fluctuate a lot, then that relationship or identity you have with that other person is a little bit more stable and consistent. Is Think about your your friends and the best friends that you have. Even your best friends you meet <clears throat> maybe once every two weeks, probably, and you might talk with them sometimes. Think about your family. Yeah. You don't choose your family, and so family is a little bit a little bit different. But when you reflect on your family, you think about things that they understand and know about you that other people don't know. And somehow when you get together, you exist in this sort of space that also 
includes sort of by by assumption the past in other words you have a shared history with these people even if they're not your favorite that that gives some some kind of as you said maybe ground to your existence in the world and i think marriage has that quality except mm-hmm. the bonus is that you get to choose the person so i think mm-hmm. if you're discerning about it then you get to choose a person to be with who then you can create these sort of experiences with together who you're around every single day basically um who you sort of bounce off of in a way and that that adds a layer to living that that is real and meaningful and i think that's true even if there aren't children yeah. And, I, and I think it also beyond that, there's there are definitely financial benefits to it. For example, you can both earn money, you can support each other, you can encourage each other. And I don't think those things, even though they seem traditional, are are without merit. I think that they're extremely valuable. I just think that people choose too quickly who they're going to get married to and then make a mistake and end up hating the person. So I think as long as it's a, the right person and a good person, then um, it can be extremely beneficial on a number of le- of levels. Um, yeah. But then I think in, in America, we have a hookup culture, very much a hookup culture, and it's becoming more and more so. And the hookup culture, I don't know where it comes from, but it seems to be more than it was or there more than it was even 10 years ago, and maybe that's just because of Tinder. But that feels much more like Rome than anything else. That is sort of on par with with Rome. I guess people aren't, aren't married, but still there's this sort of culture of whatever pleases me now, and then let's just move on to the next, the next thing. Mm. Um, and in Rome, it was more political because you'd have marriages to family for political reasons and arranged marriages and things like that. But still, there was this sort of decadent pleasure culture. And as you move, mm. as you move forward in your life, you're seeking the next delight. And I think that seeking the next delight doesn't really lead to anything. But creating strong memories through time can. That's, that reminds me of something that, uh, Yuval Noel Harari. How do you say that guy's name? The wrote I think Sapiens. it's Yuval Noel Harari. I think is his name. Okay, uh, he mentioned that the opposite. I don't know. Or I one of the things he talks. Huh? Maybe I've got that backwards. Uh, one of the things he talks about is our idea of pleasure and its scales. And so, uh, <clears throat> when you get kind of like a drug. When you, when you have a drug for the first time, it's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And then uh, at this dosage, and then you become accustomed to it. So you have to have bigger dosage, a bigger dosage, a bigger dosage to have that same sort of awe-inspired or awe-inducing effect. And so um, – and he was saying that because of one of the, one of the effects of technology – is to allow the or to diminish how uh, the now hook, hooking up uh, is incredibly available and incredibly possible. Whereas before, there may have been more labor involved in it, where you oh you got to go to the bar, I have to have money to go to the bar, I have to be in the right place, I have to be around the right people, and there are all these sort of uh, Checklist, a checklist of things you have to do to even be there in the spot to make hurdles, this one thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, hurdles could be hurdles. It, um, maybe, yeah, uh, things you have to do to get to the point where you're even available on on the field, essentially. Yeah. And then with things like with a, a phone, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to the bar. You don't, you don't have to have the money to buy alcohol. You don't have to have the car to get you to the bar or to pay for the Uber ride to get there. You can just get on your phone. And, uh, so sort of the, the, the challenge to get to the goal is 
just that the barrier is gone. And so, yeah, no barrier to entry. Yeah. So it's not as, so maybe, you know, kind of like with factory farming, the, what the price paid to get to this stage is just, we're not even aware of it. So, and maybe disregarding the price paid to get to that stage could be harmful. Kind of like, it sounds like it happened in Rome happened in, you know, several civilizations and a lot, in a lot of places in recent memory too. So, uh, anyway, it just, I wanted to tie in Homo Deus because you sent it to me and also that's a good, that's a pertinent. That's a good, that's a good, uh, uh, analogy. I think the barrier, the barrier to entry. Um, one other thing I did want to mention that I kind of forgot to mention is um, a check on a check on tendencies. If I lived by myself, I think I would be a worse person than I am as a married person. Really, I think I would. I think I would uh, go four days without washing the dishes. I think. I would do more things like that yeah. and having by dishes, you mean who, your face <laughs> having a person who ex, having a person who expects something of me yeah, and who isn't impressed by me whatsoever is I think <laughs> like mu- mushroom uh-huh. mushroom is, is impressed by absolutely nothing that I do. Yeah. It's incredible. Like nothing. It's amazing. But it's, I really, I'm really glad for that because it, yeah. I feel like I have to always be at the top of my game. In other words, I need to try all the time. But when you're with yourself, people rarely have the fortitude to be at the top of their game for themselves because people don't have enough self-respect, including myself. So I think yeah. I think it's a way to force yourself to have the self-respect to be impressive to yeah. another person. If that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. To not just be a schlub. Not yeah, which I am. <laughs> yeah. So I've out- seen it. Out- I've seen it. Is I out- lived with him for four months. <laughs> <laughs> Outsider's perspective, then, as a non-married married man in his uh, late fifties. I don't know how old you are, but. Um, Late fifties. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what What is it? What does it look like to you? Marriage. Uh, I, I guess I, I, I've seen examples of both, sort of, where it seems like there's a healthy back and forth of sort of a, a healthy dance, essentially, where you have a an edifying push and pull. Uh, and then I've, I've seen examples of what you mentioned before. It was uh, marriage to maybe the wrong person, um, a bad person. You, you said you encouraged marrying the right person and a good person. Um, so, but yeah, I... it seems like it, it can it can be kind of like with sugar or with a phone, you know, there's a, it can, it's, it's just a thing that exists and it can be what we would call beneficial or detrimental. So it depends on how you use it. So, but I think, I think the, then to sort of close that, that point would be that the <clears throat> pressures that shape who it is that we choose as a mate or a spouse are are not correct. The pressures are off. In other words, if you marry the right person, you do so in spite of the norms. You do so in spite of yeah. it because the norms would push you to marry your high school sweetheart who's probably uh, a disaster. We're going to end up as a disaster. Probably, very likely, rather than you know, get married when you're 35 and then really think about it and actually go through the the steps of deciding whether or not this is a person logically that would be a good fit for you, which is actually something that 
people don't do. Right. When I was getting married, I went, I, I made a checklist before I decided. <laughs> I did. I really did. It was That's not, cool. it was fun. not impulsive at all. I went through it. it, it does, this make, does this make sense? And it was very much a, the decision for me to get married at the time that I did was, it was the most or the least romantic decision that could possibly have been made. Very, it was very practical and checklist oriented. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but now I'm, I'm glad that, that that's the way that I did it, and I would encourage anyone else to do the same thing. And that doesn't mean that I have I have necessarily a perfect perfect marriage, but but you know so far so good. Yeah, I would imagine myself doing the same thing if that event should ever. <laughs> broach the threshold of my life's doorstep is that I would be like, yeah, I need to make a list. I got to, you know. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Be back in five so, minutes. <laughs> yeah, I got it. This is it. Uh, Get out. You don't make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's some movie where they do that. Oh, man, I forgot. It's, it's, a, it's a movie where this guy has a friend who is, who had his, his, potential mate has to go through this checklist of knowledge of sports facts and she has to pass it or else she's not, she's not good enough. I can't remember what movie it is, but, um, anyway, uh, yeah. So drawing it back, I mean, so then because episode six is so heavy on male, female marriage, uh, old way of doing things, new way of doing things, dynamics, did this did that episode speak to you at all because of the presence of that stuff or what stuck out? Well, I'd like to hear your thoughts <clears throat> on that first. I feel like with episode six, at this point, okay, we kind of know everybody's philosophy, and now we're seeing their philosophies and lifestyles in action. So episodes one through three, heavy on philosophy. Who is this, who are these characters? What are they doing? And then you sort of get the challenges where run, okay, run the now program. we see them. Right, right, right. Now we're in the simulation. Yeah, let's see what happens when we do these things. And then you get a big challenge, and now you're sort of in the, the denouement of what they've gone through. Have, you know, okay, we've seen the challenge conquered, and now we're seeing, okay, what's every, what's, has every, everything seems to have been resolved, but has everything really been resolved? And so now we're seeing, okay, over the long haul with these characters, their true nature is their un, unchallenged aspects of the personality. They're, the parts that haven't been worked out or exercised, now they're starting to show up. And maybe we're getting further into, we're, we're getting, we, we took care of one of the symptoms of the problem in this world, which was, the, the meth dealer with the, the the drug dealer I forgot his name um the do do yeah so reg and with reg yeah old reg um so we've seen him taken care of but and we think everything's good but wait a minute something is still isn't right there's still something bubbling under the surface and so now that's the next challenge to get it uh, which also brings along character development of well, what's going on with Rust, what's going on with Marty and his marriage. You know, we've seen him go through this change, supposed change in his, his habits or his mind, but it's it hasn't really he hasn't really changed. So the, he's, he the, the moment at which he's standing in front of the bar with a bag Fox. of tampons, looking at the bar is the most important moment in the entire episode, I think. That moment when he he's standing at the bar and he looks down at the tampons, he looks back up at the bar. He's he's going through. Basically, he's just he's running out the simulation. And in this simulation, <clears throat> there's a there's a switch that gets tripped at a certain point when the when the image that a person like him gets so far skewed toward one end of maybe 
non-masculinity, according to society, gets so far skewed toward that that he's no longer able to live with what he's about to become, and he sees that a life of uh, basically boring tampon runs tam- tampon boring family manness is about to play yeah. out he he has to flip a switch or a flitch is a, a, a switch is flipped in the simulation yeah. and he's programmed in spite of everything i mean he's just come through this ridiculous battle back into favor you know <clears throat> with his family with his yeah. life he's finally on stable ground in spite of it now he feels that he's going to just sort of fade out and become a grandpa with grandkids who doesn't really mean anything to anybody, and he never really did anything, and he's not really a man, according to the image that he has of what it means to be maybe a, a man or someone who who has a, a life worth living. Maybe that would be very different for someone like Rust, who's actually thought that out, but Marty is proxy for society's mold of of masculinity and he is that simulation playing out in this sort of battleground and the simulation is unfolding between the the free thinker the independently minded the uh the person who's sort of uh gone into the abyss and come out and the person who is a cookie cutter of what so- what society has created and then maggie acts as the sort of catalyst for for the simulation to play out when the simulation plays out it's the man who's gone th- gone into the abyss who comes out not on top but comes out as the victim of it in a way he's the victim of the simulation because he being outside can't really overcome how how huge this sort of the simulation is and he 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 gets um uh, he gets uh, put on probation. Uh, he gets seduced. He, uh, mm. you know, he gets sort of crushed by it in a way, and he has to then co- eject out further, and he has to lo- loosen a little bit of the tether on his his uh, hot air balloon so that he gets a little bit farther away from <coughs> from the the ground, basically. And then and then Marty, who's acting out the sort of the stereotype, the uh, the cookie cutter mold, he has to be triggered to come back to combat his sort of anxiety about just just bleeping out of existence because he doesn't know why he exists and he hasn't found it yet. And because he hasn't found it yet, he feels insecure in himself because his concept of masculinity is all he has, even though it's sort of an artificial construct that he's been handed. <clears throat> and then when he goes into the bar, he's made the choice to, He's made the choice to head down that road. So when he sees the devil on the table after he has sex with that girl, it's not that he is actually evil, but it's that it's society that's telling him, basically just putting him through the motions, like now you have to see yourself as evil. It's sort of like he's just going through this maze, but there's only one way through the maze. So two things there. Uh, One is about the the little tchotchke but also uh the song that's playing when they're in bed together is a song by father john misty and the refrain is every man needs a companion and another line in that song is joseph campbell couldn't write me a myth that joseph campbell and the rolling stones couldn't give me a myth so i had to write my own really i didn't notice that it's just well, that you don't hear it, but I I love that guy's work, and so I just I just know the songs. But oh, okay. because I don't think I don't think any of the words, I can't remember any words being sung during that scene. But that is the song that's playing, and it's just ah, it's so clever. Um, and so then that tchotchke, uh, it's you know it's it's almost like the the main female roles in that episode. Maggie is sort of the temptress, uh, the seducer, and then this young girl, the former prostitute, is a temptress and a seducer. So, uh, I, and uh, it seems like that it, that case can you can extrapolate from our, from the conversations we've had before that kind of like what you're saying now. That is what American society 
compels women to become, in a sense. You think? It, or it, mm. or it, it, maybe, it could be just modern industrial, first world uh, cultures and society, but it, it does seem to be that, that this is the role that we compel females to play. Mm. To, I mean, to some degree. I'm sure there's truth and untruth to that statement, but I, why, why did they, I don't know, why do you think they showed that little tchotchke? I mean, you said it, but I mean. Yeah, that's, so I did, I, I guess, I, I see your point there. I mean, I would, I would agree with that, but when I saw that, I thought, I thought <coughs> this is part of the, the race. Whenever I think about Marty, I think about a, a racetrack that has no switches, a racetrack that that it it turns and it goes up hills and it goes down hills, but it's there from beginning to end before anything starts. So we can almost yeah. we can almost it could be Marty or you could put another person in there. Whatever it doesn't matter. That mold has been cast, and it's been cast that way because of the the structure of of american society or if you want to say first world society so when i saw that i saw it as sort of like him hitting the next phase it's a sort of signal to say all right well now he's reached the phase where he's sort of after that after he does that he becomes uh very loving toward his family and sort of wants to sink now into that being his now his mode of existence right um uh, he's accepted it of himself because he's done it again so it's different than the first time right and the second time i think is is a little bit different and so it's sort of a signal to let us know that this is the this is version 2.0 of infidelity in a way mm. and this is what it looks like and it's about to unfold now and and i that doesn't mean necessarily it's going to unfold in the way that it did but but it's just it looked it looked like a little signal to me yeah well and when he goes home he talks to his the daughter that's rebellious the same way as the overbearing kind of smart ass uh unsympathetic father to her that he had before these are my, this is my house where are you acting like you're acting you're still a little little jerk for being unconventional and then he talks to his other daughter, hey, you're the good daughter. You're the one that's playing the role that I think you should play. And then he, you know, treats treats Maggie the way that he does. Just almost, I don't know, kind of like an ornament. <laughs> or, mm -hmm. Yeah. But he's, but he's also, he's also trying to, he's almost, I don't, know, I don't want to say fake. When he's eating spaghetti, and she made the spaghetti for him. And he just says, oh, thanks. And she's eating the spaghetti. There's something about that moment that sort of encapsulates the everything that's going on there in their dynamic. He yeah, sees her the as the ornament, but he has to then recognize her as that by saying thanks. He, he wants to slip into that. And maybe he's okay with her knowing it would almost hope that if she did find out that she would ex accept it as who he is now because they're so deep into family life that she wouldn't leave again but she's mm. too independently minded maybe yeah it seems like she's she would be the kind of person who has accepted and opted in to the role of a parent and a, and a wife, not because it was something that she was supposed to do, because it was something that she wanted to do. That she said, "These are, this is what it is. This is the cost. This is the benefit. And yes, this is something that I want to do." Whereas, you know, she made, she's the one that made the the list before. Uh, right. Yeah. Walking she's, down the aisle. Yeah. Yeah. And Marty is the one that uh, just sort of made the wrong uh, list. <laughs> <laughs> Marty's. <laughs> excuse me the one that uh just followed the prescribed role so yeah uh yeah that's that's uh, did did you take anything away from maggie's seduction of i was gonna i was uh, gonna actually ask Rust? ask you that uh because 
she knows that she has to do that in order to make the next thing happen. The interesting thing is that she <clears throat> wouldn't go home with a stranger, and she mentions that to Rust. Yeah. That there's a bond between her and Rust, and that she knows that if she does that with Rust, she can she can check that box in order to make in order to initiate the next the next step without yeah, yeah, yeah. without betraying herself. In other words, by by going home with a stranger, she would somehow violate some code of ethics that she has. She has a core. Yeah. She has a an inner an inner self that she's not going to violate, that she's not she's not going to break her own rules. She's not mm-hmm. going to She's not going to just cheat on her husband, who she's very angry with, for some, for for no reason. She's not going to just give that away to some stranger at a bar. She can only give that yeah. away. She can only give that away to someone who she knows will resent her for it, who doesn't mm. want it. Someone who has maybe yeah. some sort of spiritual connection with her, which is definitely Rust. So I yeah. think I think she knows that Rust will hate her for it, and that's what allows her to go through with that, with it. Because when they're yeah. when they're that scene is is the opposite of romantic. I mean, that's like watching two lions copulate. It lasts four seconds. So it's, it's done. It's not. It's like a, let's just let's do this, and then I'm gonna leave, and you'll be angry, and then it'll be done. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's very calculated. Yeah. Do you do you did one of the things that struck me with that scene is the uh, you know the he's he's they're surrounded by morbidity there's uh photos of corpses and stuff hang uh, posted on the wall he's drinking he's got the evidences from the crime scene there so it's i don't know there's uh there's sort of this tabooish but provocative and evocative eroticism to it uh like a nine inch nails video <laughs> Like, like, cl- like closer, I guess, because it's, but because you know there's chemistry between the two of them, and right. it's like, man, these are the two people that should be together. They're the they're the the complementary pair that right. would be. They've got when they're in the same room. There's sparks there, yeah. And they're and they're equals, yeah. They're you know they're they're equals in the the, the way that they sort of you know that they're their spirits. Uh, interact with one another. So, yeah, I, the, the the it's it's you know what they're doing is a forbidden thing. Yet it's almost something you would like to see happen because it's man, these people would be great together. But then there's these barriers between them, and okay, that's fine. You know, she wants to honor the marriage. She doesn't want to interfere with the marriage. Great, that's cool. They're also honorable people. And then. But they violate that, and then you've got this, you know, death, just macabre stuff everywhere. So you got sex and death again. That's a a motif throughout stories. But the violation, but the violation is violation on both of their terms. It, it's violation without forcing either of them to abandon their principles. They are both principled people right yeah. and and it's it's violation in a way that may that allows them to both protect their um their to, to to be to remain who they are rather than changing if they were to fall in love and have a sort of romantic ongoing relationship that that wouldn't work they would have to change as characters in order to make that happen yeah that would never happen with rust but her sort of barging in in the middle of the night seducing him and then it being a very fast thing that then forces that then when he sort of wakes up from being seduced makes him realize that he's been tricked gives <clears throat> give them gives them both what they need he's been tricked and so he's able to say well i i didn't trespass i didn't go beyond my limitations and what i won't go beyond yeah she is with with her connection to him able to do that because she knows that that's how he'll see it. So then it yeah. becomes this sort of like canceling out action. It cancels itself. Yeah. And that's yeah, yeah. how I saw it. It's sort of, sort of uh, this thing that has to happen, 
Uh, yeah, let's, do yeah. it, let's do it as quickly as possible. And then now it's at zero again. I was just going to say, I mean, it, it from, I remember the first time I watched this series and I was thinking, Oh man, they're probably going to, they're going to hook up. <laughs> she's going to cheat on Marty with him. Cause he's, you know, Marty's cheating on everybody. Uh, or no, well, not in some sense, but on her for you know specifically. Uh, another maybe way to shed light on what the writer is trying to get across is frame that sex scene up against uh, Marty's sex scene with the girl, and so it's you know there's a lot of it's I, I guess it lasts longer. Uh, it's very bright. It's very there's a level of life and innocence because she's young and yeah. she's they're both alive yeah both both into it um there's a lot of sort of excitement and enthusiasm and then you get the exact opposite <laughs> in uh uh rust and, and maggie's two, there's something with two enlightened nihilists <laughs> going into right. going into it with it, their genitals out <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's but it's almost, you know, their, the act that they perform is almost archetypal. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's almost like this is, this is just Ritual. a, uh, 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 and, ah. Uh, Ritualistic? I don't want to say, huh? Ritualistic? Oh, yeah, maybe sacramental, ritualistic, or it's, 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 it's like two gods having, to to like a god and a goddess yeah. having sex yes as yes when you i get agree marty and uh the girl and it's just it's peasants like two, in the two, two, two... <laughs> a nymph a nymph and farmer dan yeah in the, in yeah. the radish patch <laughs> yeah well that's yeah. a cute little nymph there yeah. <laughs> bouncing hey, around sure like that. It's a shovel <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's very funny. Two two demigods and a, a nymph and a radish farmer. Good. Yeah. One is, Good. and it's you know when you think of when you think of the the acts of these primordial gods and all these old stories, it's it carries the same type of almost. I like to think of it as a macabre weight in the sense that there's you've got this sexual act going on with a procreative act, you know. It can be potentially yeah. going on with a uh, the act of death. So, you've that, and again, you've got life and death in that same scene, and it just puts so much weight into that act, kind of provoking that archetypal perception of of them. So yeah. I, that's what that's yeah. what I got out of I, it. I totally, I totally agree. I think that's I think that's about right. Um, I think if it were any different, then then. It couldn't happen. Yeah. And I also think there's something really powerful in her coming to Rust and saying, I almost did it. She says, I almost did it, and then does it. But it yeah. is not doing it. There are two it's for her. One is the it that allows her to be herself and remain who she is, maintain her integrity. The other is the it that causes her to lose who she is, which is what she almost did. So she <clears throat> doesn't give into temptation but she goes through with the thing that helps her separate from the um the, the potato farmer she didn't stoop to marty's level right. and by not stooping to his level she remained the the goddess with all her volition and agency intact i think that's exactly right I think that's exactly right. The, that that was I think that was the part that hit me most about that scene. I almost did it as she was coming in to do it, saying I almost did it because she knew yeah. why she came in there. She brought the bottle of wine. They didn't drink it. They didn't drink it. <laughs> so he could say after that, well, at least I got a free bottle of wine. <laughs> it's not wild. It's not wild turkey, but I'll take it. <laughs> I got this wonderful Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't speak oh. like Matthew McConaughey. He has a whistle whenever he makes an S sound. His he whistles a little bit. Did you notice that? Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how yeah, he does it. I do. It's the shape of his tongue, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um. 
I wanted to bring up the 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 last thing I wanted to bring up is the um the moment in the interrogation room with the woman and Rust telling her to kill herself. And I wonder what you think about yeah. that. Um is it Yeah, go ahead. I I think the the thing I remember thinking was that okay, this is the point at which Rust is fed up with everything. He's switched and he's he's gone into full fuck everyone mode. And he, he does in that episode. That's what he does. And that's what he says to everybody. And also that's sort of what everybody's saying to him. He gets, uh, which he's sort of doing it himself because he can't suffer fools essentially. Right. And so he's getting fed up and he's reached his breaking point. Right. And so he tells that woman that if you get the chance, you should, kill yourself and even you know that seems even a little dark for him some people might read that as him taking taking vengeance on someone who took the life of a child when he would do anything to have his child back hmm yeah good point man yeah and yeah and, and you know that in and, and that situation, I mean that that the, this whole series is about the death of women and children. He no longer has a wife, and his child died. So, and you know, in some to some in some way, they're both dead to him. So maybe he's trying to make amends for uh, his for that situation. His life he's projecting it upon this murder that he's the, investigating with Marty. Maybe the yeah the f- ferocity with which he goes after people who end the lives of perfectly innocent people might be a way for him to, in his own mind, balance the, the sheet and, and yeah. sort of get to zero within himself. Not that it was, his, yeah. not that it was his fault, but just, you know, to, to, to somehow in some way balance it out. And I think we could probably have, uh, another conversation about that in an episode. <laughs> not that, well, so, I, not that so, I've seen the next episode or anything, <laughs> or the next. Well, so I, yeah, I'd, I'd mentioned to you before that I would <clears throat> that I might lay out that card exactly. That maybe this whole series one through eight is him trying to come to terms with his uh, th- that this this is his sort of ascension to the next level of consciousness. Him dealing with that undone uh, wound or the unhealed wound that he has for his role in the life of his in his marriage and in the life of his child that died so it's him trying to come to terms with that that he projects onto this case the ability he attacks it with such ferocity like you said because he finds this as maybe a means to make amends or to balance the sheet yeah and I think if we were going to track that so we would have a loss of a child, loss of a wife, maybe the loss of the child more impactful than the loss of a wife. Although he always does mention that he lost the wife too, which is telling. A descent into the abyss, into the into narcotics, into into doing narcotics and becoming crash. In fact, becoming crash, losing himself in crash. Coming mm-hmm. coming out of it a little bit and tethering himself to <clears throat> something, something real to investigating murders, to, to, um, make sense of a, of a world that allows that to happen to him maybe, or, or whatever. And then being able to use the things that he took from the abyss to solve the mystery that he's confronted with, to be able to go back into crash and then, but not become crash completely to go back into crash and then to pop out of it. But then upon succeeding, killing Ledoux, ending that case, suddenly being surprised by the success and sort of losing himself in, in, in martiness, in, in the mundane, in just being a normal guy and having a girlfriend... <coughs> And then, and then, sort of floating until the moment when he realizes that the case 
is still alive. And then transcending that to completely unplug, in other words, to cut the the tether of his of his uh, zeppelin and go straight on his own accord rather than needing the ground to be there, which is him quitting the police, which is him telling that lady to just kill herself because he doesn't care anymore and becoming the the person that we see in the interviews to become the bodhisattva who will go after this case because he wants to and he doesn't need any excuse to do it because that's the thing that's going to allow him to to balance the books so there is a really interesting i think probably a better way to lay it out than i did but i think there's an interesting trajectory there for him that hopefully will turn out to be satisfying. Yeah, could be uh, could be an alchemical process, as a matter of fact. In what sense? Uh, the <clears throat> would you agree? Would you would you agree with that that basic arc? That's just how I sort of I would sort of track his his character as he moves through the investigation. But does that sound about right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, you know, he was just probably a, a dude. And then he got the call to adventure, which was essentially the, the death of his child. You know, it, that was the event that took him out of the, the ball, norm. the ball rolling into the thicket, right? The ball yeah. rolling into the thicket, the bike rolling into the street or whatever. <laughs> and um, <laughs> all right, we'll stop. Man, there. <laughs> that was pretty dark. Thanks, Matt. See you later. <laughs> uh now people won't forget it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but what the bike rolling and, into the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's sort of the, the entrance to his shamanistic journey of being dismembered, torn apart, dissolved, and then emerging from that as a different personality with a new name crash and a new, a new way to deal with the world um, but any, and so yeah, but then he incorporates it, and I, I think follows the rest of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Is that is that is that parallel with what you were saying? Yeah, you? yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think I'm thinking the same thing that you are. So. But you said it's alchemical in some way. So I. I oh. What did you mean by that? Yeah. So. Uh, that that was the other card I didn't want to play until the last episode because. Um. Are you hold? Are you holding cards? I'm not holding any cards. I'm every every discussion we have. I'm all out on the table. I've got I've got nothing hidden. I've got there's nothing. I'm scrambling to to catch up with you. Yeah, intellectually. Well, I, I, um, well, I don't for people that are following along episode by episode because they can't skip ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Don't skip ahead, even though I did. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I'll wait till till we do the the eighth recording to to because I've I've wanted to mention it since episode one because I think it does parallel with that alchemical process, give which us, is give us a tease, give us a little tease. So no. it's turning. There is the turning lead into gold. Obviously, uh, we can we can we can hope that both of these characters, Marty and Rust, are on that path of refining the leaden aspects of their personalities, which are disposable and useless into something more refined, more something that has been tested in the fire and refined into gold to purify out all the impurities. So that would be a good alchemical parallel. Mm -hmm. It ties back so, into the early, well, early part of our conversation today as well. <clears throat> yeah. 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 And if, if you look at, uh, again, a lot of these scientists, writers, creatives on whatever front they look at, they look at these old archaic or arcane ideas. Say, oh, what was cool about it? And is there any validity to it? Is there anything I could pull up today and say, oh, this was the cool thing that, well, actually clues me into figuring out the astro, not the astrolabe, but um, nautical tools that I can or Rene Descartes, you know, his message from an angel and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, talking about 
writers of shows and television and things like that, looking at old stories to say, okay, well, what's cool about it? What's psychologically compelling in this? Yeah. It's, so, it's sort of the, the um, 2.0-ifying the Old Testament. It's kind of bringing in, I mean, if we're tying it all into discussions that we've had today, it's sort of giving validity to what has been, but saying the the generation yeah. has passed, that's what was true for them. Now let's make something that's relevant for us, but still nod to it and give it some, give it its due, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Harry Potter, Star Wars, all that stuff, this show, I, I think it, it's compelling because they, you could say, because it's compelling, you could say that they did it right. Yeah. Because it's, here we are, we're, what, 10 hours into it talking about it now? Or Something like that. More. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to be a body of work before you know it. It's going to be cool when all eight sort of it is episodes like It's a exist. set. I mean, for nothing other than to have had the conversations, I think. Yeah. And that's uh, the the uh, value in and of itself. People to, people to... watch it and enjoy it, fine. But I've I've enjoyed exploring it. Yeah, just to Honestly. achieve it as an exercise achieved. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's all I've got, man. We're at two hours and 42 minutes. Jesus Christ. Damn. Well, we had a pretty, uh, I think, uh, some people. Oh, 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 man. Talking about the, I was looking at my notes. Um, man. Uh, so one of the things that Maggie says in that sex scene is, uh, some people, no matter where they look, they see themselves. So yeah. Yeah. just again, to add to their sort of archetypal God, goddess identities in that scene, uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Well, that's, um, a, that's almost, uh, that's almost a callback to Rust's line on the phone, isn't it? To an extent that, the men know what they want and they don't mind being alone. Yeah. It seems to sort of parallel it in a way. I mean, she's, she's saying this, uh, she's saying, I'll, I'll, I'll call you there and I'll, uh, I'm, I'm on the same level as you. She's sort of, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a different, it's a different expression, but, uh, she's putting herself on the demigod plane with him as, instead of being a radish farmer herself, she's identifying as, uh, a, another demigod who's worthy of um, his lion penis <laughs> <laughs> and four, and his four seconds of copulation <laughs> uh, uh, and then speaking of the the the, the women being portrayed as the, as the temptress and then oh not, not that, but why do you wait? Uh, why do you wait until we're like done before you mention anything that you wanted to? We could have been talking about this stuff for the last three hours. Because <laughs> I don't, I don't know. These are just these are sort of the addendums that I think if anybody's really interested and just wanted you know, <laughs> less spontaneous stuff that they could uh, listen, check it out. But then uh, when Rust goes to the girls' home and there's just all the damaged girls around you again look at what you know there's all these young girls that are just sort of they got thousand yard stares and they're looking at this man that's kind of come into their realm and they're all they've all been uh, affected yeah. by the real world in some way uh and then the last thing was oh the calling the school the queen of angels which is a very mystic term for it's a Catholic school or, well, it's some type, it seems like it's Catholic or some type of, it's not really Protestant, not really Catholic, but they got pictures of the Virgin Mary, statues of the Virgin Mary in that school that, that Russ went back to and it's called Queen of Angels. So this is sort of a old, more pagan, ancient literature and text yeah. kind of term rather than our mother of suffering kind of thing. I've got a I've got a queen of martyrs near me. Really? Mm -hmm. That's what I that go sounds to. So, that sounds so metal. It's it's a really great uh, it's a really great church. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's huge. It's beautiful. 
Yeah. And I, I go there all inspiring often. Huh? Awe inspiring? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like to just soak it in. I don't know what it is, but I like to just be there and soak it in. Whenever I go there, I think of, I think of catacombs and and scrolls and and self-flagellation and you know, I think of all that it stuff and I just sort of, I just sort of soak it in. Yeah, because it 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 it, it hints at all that stuff. The architecture is yeah. the same. The windows are the same. You're looking at something that has not had its upgrade. You're looking at something yeah. that hasn't been subjected to Protestantism. You're looking at something that is almost, well, in in its core, the way that it was a thousand years ago. And it's a way to sort of glimpse, it's a way to sort of glimpse that, not naive, but primitive spirituality that people had back then and i i really enjoy it and i do the same thing i go to a hindu temple quite often too what if by looking at that stuff you know we talk about upgrading the the structures the architecture the places and the the decor and the routines what if there's a level of upgrading ourselves to be able to see it as it as those things the architecture for example exists now and then have such a knowledge of where it came from and all the things that led up to it. And because we know those things too, we can also project forward and know what it could, how it could be useful in the future, future so that we wouldn't necessarily have to tear it down or uh, sort of like demolish the building. So that, yeah, that's so. the new Testament though. That's what the new Testament did. I think that's why it's such an innovation. I, okay. it, it was able to look back and incorporate rather than look back and demolish because right, okay. you you could have built the New Testament and left it as a standalone, but if you build in the Old Testament, it's as I said, it's sort of self reinforcing. So it's exactly what you're saying. It's a way to, mm. if you if you understand the past, but you also know that this can't go on because the 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 moral zeitgeist has transcended, um, yeah. you know, abiding slavery and and all of these ridiculous uh, regulations. We've gone past yeah. this. If we don't do something, then these traditions are going to fade. So what do we do? We have to recognize what merits are there, but we also have to contextualize it and modernize it. So I think what you're saying is basically, let's learn about the past, let's understand it, and then let's project forward so that we can we can make sure that it stays relevant. And that could be a show like True Detective, which is trying to carry some of the archetypes of our ancestors forward into sort of the modern mental landscapes that we we live in and we're because you know we're kind of inundated with entertainment to be able to just insert a little bit of that into into popular culture is quite an achievement. Mm -hmm. And if it if it if it becomes if people value it then it stays relevant and it doesn't die. It's sort of like having children. It's sort of like, mm. like you know, when I, I met my grandma at Thanksgiving and then I looked around at the 38 other people who were there and I said, I looked at her in the face and I said, you made all these people. None of us would be here if it weren't for you. And she said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. That's awesome. It was it was it's kind of a <laughs> profound thing, but imagine if you were her. Yeah. Imagine what that would feel like. I mean, we were talking in the last in the last uh, 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 discussion about being at the end of life mm -hmm. and looking back and saying, you know, God damn it, I wish. Do you mm -hmm. think she looks around at the thirty eight people who she created basically and says, God damn it, I wish? No, there's no way. There's no way she is sailing yeah. gracefully into into the next the next life without any. She talks about it all the time, um, and she's fine with it. She's clearly at ease with who she is at the age of eighty six or eighty seven, and it's pretty. I think wow. it's pretty incredible, um, and you can kind of see it on her face. She's not. Yeah. She's not afraid. She's, she doesn't have regrets. She knows who she is.
I think it's all it all sort of ties. <laughs> and there ain't nobody there to stop her. <laughs> <laughs> Still having kids, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 